Energize Africa. Thank you for joining us here today again for our Cuppa Club. Uh, so today we're going to be talking to uh, two ethical businesses and uh, the trailblazers that, that run them. We've been working with um, these organizations for a few years now. Um, so I'd like to introduce John Steele, who is the CEO from Cafe Direct. Hi, John. Good morning. Hello, everybody. Thank you. Uh, and Matthew Clayton, CEO from Thrive Renewables. Hi, Matthew. Good morning. So we'll be finding out more about their businesses and what drove them to set up their organizations in the way that they have. Uh, and what role ethical investors have in driving their businesses forward. Um, so each business will introduce themselves for about five to 10 minutes. Um, and then I'll be asking the, um, uh, them some questions. And then we'll open up to Q&A from the audience. Uh, you can submit any questions you like through the chat function all the way through the webinar. Uh, and I'll try and feed those into the discussion. Um, if you have any follow-up questions, we can always uh, take those after the um, webinar. So we'll do a follow-up email. And um, we have about 45 minutes scheduled for the webinar today, um, but we can run to about an hour, depending on how many questions we have um, and how rowdy our speakers are. Um, and so uh, just before we get started, obviously, I need to just mention that um, this should not be treated as any financial advice in any way. We can't answer any specific questions relating to your personal financial circumstances. Uh, and this isn't a recommendation to invest. It's purely a showcase for both organizations. Uh, there's lots more information on the FX website. So if you'd like to um, follow up after the session, then I suggest you go and have a look there. Um, so both of these organizations have been with FX really since uh, we launched back in 2013-14. Um, and we really continue to believe in the great impact that both of them have achieved uh, and the way that they run their organizations, particularly in terms of the ownership uh, which is highly accessible to individuals to um, participate. And these organizations were effectively crowdfunding before crowdfunding even existed. Um, and many of the businesses or organizations that we represent on FX are, are doing things for the first time. Um, but actually, these organizations have been running for a number of years, um, have a long track record, and it's an opportunity for individuals to invest in organizations that um, have been established for, for a number of years. So they're active within the, what we call the secondary market. Uh, and we're going to find out a little bit more about that in due course. Um, and so first of all, I'd like to um, bring on Matthew to give us an introduction to Thrive Renewables and then we'll move over to John and then I'll um, open up um, some questions. So over to you, Matthew. Thanks very much. Morning, everyone. Um, yeah, so just a quick intro um, to myself and um, Thrive Renewables. Um, so I'm Matthew. Um, I've been with Thrive Renewables. I joined Thrive Renewables in 2006, um, which is roughly halfway through its, well, it's just a little under halfway through its 25 year history. Um, and since then, I've really, really enjoyed um, building projects primarily, um, uniting more impact investors together and also developing and building um, a, a great team. In terms of what Thrive is, if, if you, or the reason we exist, um, if you're not familiar with us, is, is really there's two sides to our, our, um, our mission and vision. Firstly, it's to um, or, or invest in and contribute to um, the energy transition to a cleaner, greener system um, for the UK, which works in a smarter way than the, the, the fossil fuel based system. But also really, really importantly, it's about allowing individuals um, to participate in that. So it's not just an exclusive club for um, yeah, pension funds, for, for, for investment houses. It's about allowing real people to invest in real assets. And, and generate some, some real rewards from that. 
And so in the simplest sense, um, the company is a renewable investment company or renewable energy investment company. Um, but what makes us different then is, is that funding model, which, which Lisa alluded to. So what we, we're very deliberately structured in a way which allows individuals to invest in us. And we're really proud of our wide ownership. So um, our smallest investor has invested five pounds in us. Um, our largest investor has invested about five and three quarter million pounds in us. And we really pulled together a really large group of, of people. We, we current, our investor base is currently about 6,250 people. And the average investor is about the £8,000 mark. And we're really pleased with that mix because I think the, we, we have the governance to support those large impact investors um, and to give them confidence in what we're doing. But we're also really um, accessible and, and the FX platform really helps with that. So in terms of what we do, um, so to date, um, over the last 25 years, we've invested in 25 renewable energy projects. Um, so when we started out, renewables was less than 2% of the UK electricity mix. We we're very pleased that in 2019, it was 36% of the energy mix. So it's no longer an alternative. Perhaps maybe it's very much fairly squarely part of the energy system. But actually, I've just read that if we continue with the energy mix that we've had for the next for the last two months, for the next 24 hours, will have hit the first uh, record-breaking two months with no coal on the UK grid. Um, and at times in the last um, couple of weeks, the grid has been um, yeah, about a tenth as carbon intensive as it was when we started out 25 years ago. So yeah, really good, good news on that, that high level um, for renewables at the moment. But coming back to our portfolio, um, so we've invested in 25 projects. Um, we currently own or are funding 15 and we're building a further three at the moment and we'll talk a bit more about that. Um, a project to us is a renewable energy project primarily, so either the portfolio at the moment is wind and hydro um, with a bit of heat in there as well. We've also invested in solar but we haven't got those, we haven't got those, um, we're not owning any solar at the moment. And our portfolio, our, our, the furthest north we've gone is on Orkney. Um, we've got a very busy turbine which endures the uh, the harsh, almost maritime weather that, that Orkney gets. Um, and then we come as far south as Bristol. We've got four turbines which we've built around a sewage treatment plant in Avonmouth. Um, and then we go as far east as um, Nest Point in Suffolk, which is actually the country's most easterly point. And we've got a turbine on the seawall there. So, yeah, try and have a bit of geographic diversity in the portfolio as well as technology and diversity. And what we're really about in terms of when we're investing in projects um, is plugging what we see as a quite a big gap, which is between what an individual or a community can do on their own and what a utility is interested in doing. So we tend to invest between 500,000 and 15 million in any one project, and we've built up the portfolio of a number of projects. So, yeah, we're really trying to work collaboratively to make, to make projects happen. And what that means for our um, investors is that um, last year we generated enough electricity to power the residential needs or the homes of a city the size of Worcester. Um, so 75,000 tonnes of emission reductions associated with that, that generation. Um, and when we would boil that down to what it means for our, our average investor, if you can describe anyone who invests in us as an average investor, um, that means we have um, that they're generating enough renewable electricity to supply themselves and their eight neighbours, um, or 14,000, sorry, 14 tonnes of um, emission reductions, which roughly equates to two um, carbon, two people's worth of carbon footprint per annum. And then financially, um, if we look at the, the returns which people have generated from their investment in us, in addition to the environmental impact, then um, the average annualised return is about 7% per annum. And that's the combination of a dividend and also the capital appreciation as we've grown the portfolio, our share price has, has developed as well. Um, and we've managed to pay a dividend in 19 of the last 20 years, um, which is really important to us because it's about demonstrating that sustainability, both at the impact on the social level or the environmental and social level, but also that financial level. So in terms of where we're going at the moment, um, we've committed um, £12 million at the moment to three new investments, which between them will generate 11,000 homes worth of electricity. So in terms, again, boiling it down to our investor, our average investor, then that's another two homes they'll be generating electricity for, so going from eight to ten homes. 
um, in addition to theirs, or another three and a half tons of emission reductions. And the projects we, we work with, because we try to work collaboratively, we've got quite a flexible funding model. So the first of the, those projects is a what we call a private wire project, where we're building um, a small wind farm, which will generate electricity, which we plug straight into uh, an industrial consumer. Um, and so that does two things. It gives us the comfort that we've got that customer and, and we're able to get a, a good price for our power from that customer because we're saving them money against what they'd import their power from the grid for. Um, and we also improve their environmental credentials, which tends to win our industrial hosts new business because we're basically reducing the carbon footprint, reducing their costs. And um, yeah, they can then demonstrate to their clients that they've got a cleaner product um, than, than they had previously. So that's a private wire project, which we, we, a wind project, which we're developing in South Ayrshire at the moment. We've got a hydro project, a two megawatt hydro project in the Scottish Highlands, um, which is being built at the moment. Um, so it's been an interesting couple of months for that, um, but that's on schedule um, to, be, to be generating um, towards the end of this year. Um, and that project in itself will generate two, 1,250 homes worth of electricity. Um, something a little bit different for us is we've also um, made an investment in a, a geothermal project um, in Cornwall. And this project um, will take um, the heat, the natural heat, which is radiated from, from the granite bedrock in, in Cornwall. Um, and we'll do two things with that. That heat will um, generate electricity. So there'll be a three megawatt generation, electricity generation plant there but also can supply heat um, um, to so zero carbon heat to local businesses and homes, which is really important to really because because the, the heat challenge in terms of climate change and the way we get our heat is, is really the, the unsolved problem um, in, the, in the UK and world globally, really. So and, and the other interesting thing with that, that is the three megawatts of electricity will be generated from that will be base load. So it doesn't matter if it's day or night like solar or if it's windy or not with wind this will be renewable energy 24 7 which is really important in terms of building from the 36 percent renewables on the grid to, to the the sort of 70 80 90 that we need to get to um and i think i can probably leave it there and we can just um add some more as we go through if that's about right yep that is perfect great that gives us a really nice overview of your business both in terms of you know the history and where you've come from and and what you're actually doing at the moment so um i'm going to hand over to john if you'd like to um give us a intro and an overview as well john that would be brilliant yeah, i was i was fascinated with what matthew had to say and now i'm trying to work out how to follow that um <laughs> i think kef cabinet is a, is a quite different business in, in many regards but you know clearly very much a purpose-driven business as well i think um I talk a little bit about the history and then try to bring us up to date and give a feel for how the business is today and then a little look into the future as well. Um, so yeah, business, Cafeter has been going for 29 years and um, it wasn't really set up as a business in a normal business sense. It was about four charities and three farmer organizations coming together to try and get farmers a fair price because in, in in 1989, the International Coffee Price Agreement fell apart as America exited, and the price of coffee dropped well below the cost of living for smallholder farmers across the world. And so the, these charities and, and these farmers came together to bring coffee to the UK directly and sell it in church halls and uh, fair, fair trade shops and community shops. And from that, two years later, the, the business was born. So. In the early days, it was run by four charities um, with direct contribution from the farmers. And um, I think it's always been a very pioneering organization. And you know, our purpose is very much to improve the lives of the smallholder farmers that, that we serve and the environments they, they live in, but also to ch challenge the role for business and very much to make business a force for good that balances the, the capital of, of money and social impact and environmental impact and um i think uh it's you know a business model that is is gaining momentum i think we're seeing a huge change in the last 10 years in in the role of business and i think in the current um challenging situation i'm 
we're very hopeful that businesses that have real meaning will emerge as, as businesses with greater value and um, subsidy. Um, so very much a direct business between you know, farmers and, and uh, people to try and make a difference. Uh, we pioneered a movement called Fair Trade by becoming one of the first three brands to become Fair Trade certified in 1994. And we're the only one that's remained 100% since then. So I'm totally committed to the Fair Trade movement. Uh, we're very committed to organic as well. Um, more than half of our coffee, teas and cocos are bought on organic terms. And um, you know, we're focused on coffee is our biggest uh, commodity followed by tea and cocoa and very much a branded business. Um, so at the heart of it, you've got a, a unique business model, but also a, a strong brand. Um, in terms of other, other things that we've done that have led to where we are today, as um, Lisa pointed out, we were doing crowdfunding before it was called that. And in, in 2004, we printed the phone number on all of our packs of coffee and invited um, like-minded individuals to join. And so we have four and a half thousand individuals um, who are part of the journey and represent 60% of the share capital of, of Cafe Direct. Um, we very much see ourselves as a multi-stakeholder business. So we have um, consumers who own part of the company, uh, farmers who own part of the company. One of the founding charities, Oxfam, still owns about 8% of the stock. And then an agricultural investor, Oiko Credits, also is, is a key shareholder. So very much the collaboration of like-minded individuals and organizations. Um, we engage our farmers in everything we do. So they own shares in the company. They have two board positions on board, on board meetings. So we, we directly um, work with um, a farmer in Peru and a farmer in Tanzania. Um, and then we also have a standalone charity called Producers Direct, which is farmer led, that does a lot of the impact work we do on the ground. And we, we set that up 10 years ago um, to have a genuine um, direct impact on the ground, but also to use that uh, construct to enable us to raise more significant funds from other organizations. So we raise funds from people like the Gates Foundation and, and Google and Nominate Trust to come alongside our funding to have greater impact on the ground. Um, that's a little bit of the background. I think um, we're proud to be a social enterprise, proud of our fair trade roots and uh, we recently became the first coffee company in the UK to be a B Corporation, which um, you know, I think we, we ummed and ahed about for a number of years, but concluded that it was about you know, being part of a movement to make a real difference and uh, that we could, we could help that to occur. Um, what else? Uh, we've changed significantly in the last five or six years. So we roast our own coffee in London. We're much more appreciative of our product and our brand. I think in the early days, we were very much about social impact and environmental impact. And we've learned to be a sustainable brand owner and financially strong and um, much more relevant to consumers and customers um, over time. So a really good balance between the different aspects of the business. Um, we employ 30 people, got strong management team, and um, we've been uh, in consistent growth now for three years, and we continue to grow well, despite the uh, circumstances we're in. And we're, we're determined to double the business and improve our impact and also our return to our, our various stakeholders, and um, very optimistic about the future. So there Brilliant. you go. Okay. Yeah. That's lovely, John. Thanks very much. So two quite different organisations in terms of the way that or the actual activities um, that you both um, do, but actually quite a similar ethos. Um, and I suppose, you know, all organisations that we engage with at Essex obviously have to have some kind of uh, social or environmental mission um, at the heart of what they do. But, you know, it seems to me that both organisations are uh, very in tune with having the general public 
as being a core part of your um, stakeholder makeup um, and it's part of your DNA. So why, what was the decision um, and why did you decide to set up the organisations and, and do it in that way? Maybe John, you go first and then, and then Matthew. Great, no, thank you. Um, I mean, as I said, I think it was set up very much out of crisis at the time. So, you know, the way that the four charities and three cooperatives came together was very much to fix a specific problem, which I think is, is really about in, injustice and very much about fairness. And um, I think uh, you know, th those issues are still, um, unfortunately, omn omnipresent in society. So I think, you know, we, we still have a lot to do, but I think um, we were very much set up to change um, the balance in society and to, and to look after the, the, these smallholder farmers. I mean, that, that's become incredibly more relevant nowadays. 70% uh, of food and drink comes from smallholder farmers, which you know, is a bigger population of people in America, but it's incredibly fragmented, under, underrepresented and impoverished. So I think um, from a uh, ethical point of view, it's fundamental, but also from a supply chain and food sustainability point of view, it's paramount. So you know, I think we were very much set, set up as, a, as an intervention and I think everybody who works for the business believes in what they do and are determined to make a difference. But why, why engage the, the general public sort of so early oh, on? You, okay. you could have just had, you know, institutional um, finance, but you, you chose to get yeah. the public involved really early on. Why was that? Well, no, I think we, we are trying to help society to change. And so engaging um, individuals in that journey, I think, is fundamental. I mean, I think, you know, probably 10 years before we engaged uh, in terms of share ownership, the move to take, become part of the fair trade movement was again engaging the, the communities of the UK. And I think, um, you know, it's, it's, um, it's all part of helping people to make decisions more broadly to, for the kind of betterment of society and the planet. So I think, direct engagement with beneficiaries um, is really, really important. Okay, um, Matthew? So just take myself off mute. Um, yeah, I, I, I guess I can't claim to have been there at the beginning, I'm afraid. Um, as I said, the, the, the company was established um, in 1994 and I joined in 2006. But I know that the, you know, the, the, the reason for being um, was, was a couple of things that happened. There was the Chernobyl the nuclear disaster, um, and I think that put a real sense of urgency around think, you know, about changing the way that we generate our electricity. So that that's, that was the catalyst on the renewable side, if you like. Um, but in terms of structuring it in the way we have um, as a as an unlisted PLC with the purpose of allowing individuals to participate in it, then I think it was very much about that. Yeah, there was a we felt or that the, the, the founders felt that there was a, an upwelling individual to change and the way to deliver that change um, you know, through, through you know, is, it can be done through investment. And certainly in the UK context at that time, you know, there wasn't an awful lot going on with renewables. So in terms of how to, to bring about that change, it was about direct investment. And so yeah, being able to, to pull that that level of interest in 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 the change and, and funding the change in, and practically making it happen was was really the, the 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 idea in its inception, if you like. But I think what's what's quite interesting, and, and we were we were writing um, our, our report around our twenty fifth birthday, you know, just just in sort of um, September October time, and what really really hit us as a team was um, just how it's almost become more relevant um, in that time frame. I'm not sure there's many business plans um, which would last that kind of um, test of time because you know, with, with the, the, you know, the, the growing sense of urgency and, and the risk of people feeling helpless um, with such a big problem in, in climate change, um, I think that being able to provide people with a really practical, straightforward, simple means of doing something very positive just becomes more and more relevant 
And, um, and that's certainly the feedback we get from our investors that they, you know, they, they love the fact that you know, they come to our AGMs, which we routinely, or we alternate between an office environment and, um, and going out to one of our wind farms or hydro projects. And, and, and it's, it's just so satisfying that people standing there and just feeling and seeing what they've delivered um, with their investment. And I think that that's never going to go away because it's, it's such a, you know, a practical way to do it. And both organisations have clearly um, got a strong purpose. Um, to what extent does that purpose really sort of drive your business? Is it, you know, overwhelming in terms of, you know, making sure that everybody understands that and that all of the team um, are sort of pointing in the same direction and, and that you can get all of your investors and customers behind you as well? Um, John, how does how does the purpose drive your organisation forward? Yeah, no, uh, very important question. I think um, we we have quite a yeah, high degree of involvement of the beneficiaries in terms of smallholder farmers, as, as I described, in terms of ownership and, and being on the board. I think also we created a, a kind of construct to manage the triple bottom line in, in two thousand and four which is, is called the gold standard, which um, kind of forms the three pillars of social, environmental, and uh, financial strength in the business. And then from that, there are a number of commitments. Um, and that, that kind of informs the objectives of everybody in the organizations. So I think you, you get the, the mission and you touch that through the engagement of smallholder farmers, whether that's through um, the work you do or through you know, connection with the, 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 the board members. And then on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, the objectives are driven by this construct called the gold standard, which is very much about managing the triple bottom line that flows from the mission and vision of the organization. So it's, it's relatively well structured. How about you, Matthew? I think from the, the team perspective, I mean, the, we're now, the, the core team um, working for Thrive is, is now just grown to 11 people. Um, and I think that, that, that the thread, the meaning of what we're doing is, is crucial to the, you know, it's a big part of the team's um, day to day. Your investment criteria reflects that we're trying to deliver as much impact as we can with the capital we've got. You know, the, the, the interaction we have with investors around the investments we're making is is what what steers us um, in addition with that you know, to our insight in the market so i think that the great thing about having a relatively small team is each one of us can see what we do makes a difference to everyone else and, and what we're delivering and i think that you know that that very real relationship um between yeah between yeah it our day job and and the results at the end of the year and by results I mean the environmental social and financial impact um, makes it all all incredibly relevant and I think that yeah we felt really yeah, the, the, the renewables market has had its ups and downs I think it's fair to say and and the, the last five years has been yeah quite a bumpy ride um, under you know, some with some of the decisions that the Conservative government have taken um, and I think that having that comfort that our, our investors are in it, both you know, for the, the, the primarily for the impact, but also for that you know, demonstrating sustainability, has given us a really positive foundation to build from, and one that a lot of our competitors haven't had. Um, and you see that in the you know, in the faces of, of you know, our, our friends and, and colleagues, sort of spread more widely across the sector. So I think that the purpose is, you know, it's not a uh, it's not something that gets um, yeah, added at the end of a decision-making process or, or thrown into a strategy conversation as a what about, what about that. It's, it's core, it's, it's front central, and um, yeah, it, it's pivotal in, in, in what we're doing. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to weave in some of the questions that are coming in as, as we go, okay? So um, one of the questions, which actually I think is quite relevant for both of you, um, is to do with diversification. So I'm going to generalise this a little bit so we can apply it to both um, organisations. So John, um, you know, your business has changed over the years and you've, you've diversified in terms of the, the products that you offer to consumers now. 
both um, in terms of the uh, providing tea as well, but also um, in terms of the um, copy as well, and, and the, if you pronounce that right. Um, and uh, Matt, you have obviously a, a strong renewables portfolio, but you don't have uh, solar, you mentioned earlier. So what are your plans for diversification in terms of the technology type? So uh, John, why don't you go first and then, and then Matt? Great, no, thank you. Um, as you pointed out, we, we, we have diversified our channel mix um, over time really. So I think um, yeah, we started in these kind of community centers and church halls, we moved into grocery pretty early on and very successfully. And then we've moved into out of home and education in, into universities in the sort of mid 2000s. And then more recently we've moved into direct to consumer with the acquisition of Kopi. Um, so we have a, an online coffee subscription and e-commerce business, which I think is a, is a important part of the future. It's relatively small. Uh, we bought that business in 2014 and we've we've redeveloped the technology and the branding and it's performing very well in the current environment um but that's a that's an important part of our diversification because it also gives us a direct connection with consumers you know the dialogue you can have about the purpose of business on a bag of coffee on a shelf in a supermarket is so much less than you can if you have a direct uh, relationship using technology um we also have a, a strong international business, so we have diversified into other markets, um, primarily in uh, Asia, where we're the lead brand in Singapore and Hong Kong, and then in some parts of Europe, primarily in, in Northern Europe and Scandinavia, where purpose matters and resonates more. Um, so pretty, pretty much you know, a multi-channel business, and then we've diversified into different formats of coffee and, and um, tea and cocoa. Primarily, coffee has been our stronghold. If you look at the business's performance, um, it had quite a significant period of commercial decline from 2008, from the financial crisis, to, through to about 2014. And during that period, the focus has been really on, on the, the heart of the business, coffee, red less so than tea and cocoa, which have then uh, fallen away a bit. But um, very, very much, I think, for us, diversifying in, in product and in channel is key. A lot of the innovations we're going to bring to market in the future are you know, different ways of consuming uh, products as well. Um, but yeah, no. Hope that. Thanks, and, and Matthew, over to you. And perhaps you can also include a point around, um, apart from technology as well, you were saying that you were doing more private wire um, projects as well, um, particularly probably since the fits of, of decline. So. Um, maybe include that in your answer as well. Yeah, okay, right. So I think, yeah, so you, the, the primary focus of the business because um, of the risk and return profile that we see with the investor base we've got um, is proven technologies. So we've, we've invested very, the majority of our portfolio is wind, we've got some hydro there, and we have some solar. Um, the solar we've done has been part of um, community energy community energy funding bridges where a solar project has been built by a, you know, a mainstream developer if you like um, owned by an EIS business but local community energy bridge has been really keen to be able to take ownership of their local asset and what we've done is funded um, the acquisition and then being crowdfunded out so that's the structure we've used for, 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 for our involvement in solar so far. Um, I guess we, we were reluctant um, I'm winding back the clock sort of 10 years or so now, but we, initially we were reluctant to invest in solar because if we looked at the amount of carbon or the emission reductions we could deliver per pound invested, um, when, we, when, we looked, when we compared wind, solar and hydro, hydro and wind you know, really, really smashed, um, smashed solar out of, the, out of the park, if you like. So we very much focused on that maximizing the impact we were having with our shareholders' capital. Um, now, fortunately, because there's been so much 
development in solar particularly then the cost of solar has come down so now we see solar hydro and wind being as sustainable as each other both financially uh, uh, and environmentally so our positions evolved with that through time and i think that you know the whole sector you know and, and this sort of comes to the to the next point in a way that there's not you know, we haven't found a perfect solution and it's not going to be for our energy sector and it's not going to be one technology it's going to be a combination of technologies so we need to move with that um, and whilst we need to, to and so what we've done you know, back in um, 2007 I think it was um, we invested in a company called marine current turbines which put the first commercial scale tidal turbine um, in the water in Stranford Lock which is busy, still busily generating electricity there and there have been sites um, developed um, off the north coast of Scotland now which which use that technology it's still nascent but um, but it's getting there and, and and so we made that investment um, we also see in many respects this, the geothermal investment as being uh, a departure from the norm from the proven technology but something that's important because it's delivering that base load power and and also heat which we think is really important so I think the the short answer would be that the core of our business, the, the stable foundation of our business, is going to be proven technologies. But we can see that, you know, that, that as we as we move through time, different technologies are going to be needed. And we've we've also looking really carefully at the system as well as generation because you know, renewables are at the current thirty percent, thirty well, thirty six percent of the grid electricity um, can be absorbed within the existing system. Um, but as we move to 50, 60, 70 percent, which we need to to hit you know, to, to to get to net zero, and the system needs to change, and that needs storage on the on the system, and that's not going to be just the hydro pump storage, which we'd love to have you know, to be a very big part of that. That's going to be battery storage, there's demand side management, there's energy efficiency. So what we need, to, so what we're doing is keeping the core. The, the solid foundation of the business around the proven technologies, but then contributing where we can to, to, to developing the, 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 those more system elements. And, and that's part of the, the heat investment we made. We've got a very small stake in a, in a company which puts ground source heat pumps um, into retirement homes and retirement villages because um, they have really high heat demand um, for both hot water and heating. Um, and that those ground source heat systems, sort of a couple of hundred kilowatt systems, can really make a big difference there in terms of emission reductions. Um, the demand side management, we've had a very good look at, um, but actually it's not that capital intensive. It's more of a a rollout play, uh, you know, a customer, you know, a, a, a customer relationship play, which is difficult for us to interact with when we're you know, primarily almost like a a, a clean invest, uh, infrastructure investor. So yes, so we are very keen to diversify where we feel it's prudent to do so whilst maintaining the risk and return profile we've had. But we want to do it on the in in a way that, that contributes to the transition um, in the right way. And just coming back to the point you made about the private wire model, yes. So the as the the subsidies have have melted away, um, or the financial support has melted away. Um, the renewable space um we the, the sector has built so much expertise with technology with um contracting ensuring the you know the the, the, the way power is sold and everything else but but a lot of that was framed around the financial support from governments and so we need to transition away from that and one way that we see that replacing the revenue certainty that came with roughly 50 percent financial support from the government schemes is to build relationships with businesses who have their own electricity demand um, and so what you see is is if if a business is importing electricity then they'll be paying um, between 90 and 150 pounds per megawatt hour for their electricity and you're we're selling to the the wholesale electricity market at around 40 to 50 pounds per megawatt hour so that's the difference between 50 and say 100 and there's a very nice place for both us and the host business to benefit where we can um, get a premium on the electricity we're selling and they, they can make a large saving on the electricity they're using and um, we've got um, four sites already operating on that basis we're building another one and um, yeah one very nice one is in um, Cambridgeshire uh, where there's a, a potato preparation plant um, there and they so they're using about um, so we're supplying about 60% of their electricity needs 
um, that's saving them a lot on their, their electricity bill. But what's really important to them is it's helping them to win new clients because um, people that wouldn't, you know, they've got a competitive advantage because their potatoes are cleaner, not physically, well, they are physically cleaner, but um, yeah, they're, they're greener. No, they're not, no, that's not good either, is it? But anyway, they're, um, they're a better product from an environmental perspective, a smaller carbon footprint. So yeah, so that's, that's great for us. Good. And you mentioned something which I think it would be interesting to um, reflect back at John. You talked about how you um, have your core portfolio and then you're looking at R&D and more innovation um, at the right appropriate time. John, how do you balance that within your organisation, you know, having your core business, but also needing to be quite innovative and change, you know, the, the consumer market is changing so rapidly now. So how do you balance that within your organization? Yeah, I mean, we, we, um, we were pretty innovative until about 2015. And um, then um, we, we stalled our innovation program for a couple of years, but we're back on with it now. Um, so we were the first company to do fair trade Nespresso compatible pods. And we, we um denied about it because we didn't like the um, environmental impact of the packaging, but we you know did recognize the, the need to challenge that model and to be part of it. So we innovated there. We've innovated in terms of um, direct to consumer. Um, we've got a number of projects we're working on now, but I think, you know, in answer to your question, it is a balance. And I think for us to step change our performance and really um, scale the business up to you know to uh, be a more significant organization than it has been historically it's about balancing the two so if you look at our growth over the last three years we started really with getting the flywheel of the heart of the business growing most rapidly so we have one product called Machu Picchu from Peru which is growing at about 35 percent a year and we added a decaffeinated version last year and so our growth is very much about getting the heart of the business going at such a high level and then innovating behind that. Um, so there are some innovations on, on coffee that are, are going, going to plan for 2021. Um, you know, you'll have seen exponential growth in terms of the consumption of cold coffee. And so we're, we're looking at that. Um, but it's, it is a balance. I mean, I think we've taken what we're best at, um, which are single origin coffees that taste fantastic. Uh, taste brilliant, uh, have a brilliant taste profile, but come from um, quite meaningful places like Machu Picchu and Kilimanjaro. And then we've just added a new Mexican one called Mayan Gold, which is again, picking up on the same kind of success. And so that, that's, a, that's our growth in the short term, and then innovation flows after that. Um, so it, it is a balance, because I think, you know, the, the, there's plenty of scope for really good growth in terms of expressing our model in the best way through existing products and making sure they're the best in class. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I'm going to put you both on the spot a little bit here. Um, one of the questions coming in is around sort of returns and, you know, with the, the type of organisation that you are, you both have um, a share price. Um, so there's potential for uh, capital appreciation of the share price and there's potential for dividends. Um, so how, um, Matt, come to you first, how has that evolved uh, over the last few years in terms of your return profile? Just focusing on the financial aspect at the moment um, rather than the impact, which is obviously extremely important as well. Yeah, so from the financial perspective, so as I touched on uh, in the introduction, so our average annualised return um, for, for investors um, over the course of the, the business um, is 7% per annum. Um, and that's the combination of both the dividends we've paid um, and also the capital appreciation, so the, the, the development of the share price. Um, and I think it's fair to say that the yeah, one of the largest challenges we have as a business um, from the investor perspective, you know, I think that you know, what we do is clear and hopefully you know, seen as a positive thing to be doing for the right investor. But, but not being listed 
um, creates an issue um, in that there is there is a perception. It's not necessarily reality, but there's a perception that with a listing um, comes liquidity, um, and it's important over the you know, over a business which has a life. You know, we we we're not we're not a, a ten year business plan. We're not twenty year business plan. We are here for the the transition, um, which will be a, a very long journey. And obviously, with taking uh, with with um, working with um, retail investors, it's really important to be able to provide an exit because people's financial circumstances change, their life circumstances change, and so creating adequate liquidity whilst being totally open and, and you know, being really responsible about the way we describe that is really important to us, which is why the platform's very helpful. Um, but we have had periods um, in time where. You know, despite the performance of the business, the liquidity in shares or the, the, the share trading has has traded significantly below a price that we feel fairly spare for the business. And so, what we try to do, or what we do do, um, is provide what we call the director's valuation, which gives a which gives guidance on what the company's worth. Um, we we take a, a a prudent view of the value of the assets we've got. Um, projections in the future not on the speculative elements just what we own and we provide um, what we call a, a the director's valuation which provides people with an indication of what perhaps they should be buying or selling um, shares for but it's totally at their discretion it's just guidance um, and we've seen that you know for, for periods that the, the the actual share traded price which is on a monthly auction um, has been has traded significantly below that currently it's trading around about that it was within five percent of the the director's valuation which we, we think is great so what we've introduced additionally because we do feel responsible um, for that retail investor base is what we call um uh, we ask our shareholders every year to allow to, to allow us to um, buy back a certain quantity of shares for people who've been waiting for an extended period on the market to sell their shares so that people can realize an exit um, if the market isn't in performing the right way and we'd rather not be doing that to be honest because um, you know, we'd, we'd like the market to be to be, to be working, but the reality is that um, yeah, it, it doesn't always work, and there is limited liquidity. But um, but it's working much better over the last eighteen months than it had done for the previous couple of years. And I think that's that's probably down to two things. One is we're we're trying to talk about the business a bit more and, and making that opportunity to own the business um, to more widespread. Um, but also we've, we've really through um, we, we sold a couple of our projects which wasn't really in the business plan um, to demonstrate the underlying value of the business um, and what's been great about that is we've been able to provide a, a very materials so of 40 pence um, dividend um, interim dividend from the sale of those two assets whilst retaining um, 12 million pounds to invest in new projects so we've really so we've sort of we've we've Sort of hopefully we've we've killed a couple of birds with that through that process. We've demonstrated the value of what our shareholders have done by taking the risk by buying a heap of documents. Um, in that that's that's the form we buy our projects in. It's just a planning consent and a land lease option, and turning them into operational businesses, um, operational wind farms. Um, and so we've 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 helped demonstrate the value that's there for that. Um, but additionally, those projects will keep running. You know, those, those projects were between five and ten years old. They'll run for another 15, 20 years. So they'll deliver the environmental impact that our investors have made. Um, and we can now deploy that 12 million into more projects, build new more projects, will deliver additional impact. So um, yeah, hopefully we've 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 hit hit that um hit that in the right way. Yeah, thank you. Um John, what are your reflections? Um I think um, I mean, you touched on the social and environmental returns. I think we we have we've have been incredibly strong at those, but I think we've been you know consistently disappointing in terms of a dividend return. And I think um, you know we uh, you know, being totally transparent about you know people bought into our crowdfunding at a pound a share in two thousand and four. We had a a capital event in 2010-11 where there was a chance to exit at about 67-70p around that level and then if you look on FX you know shares are trading at between I guess late teens and early 20p's so significantly below uh, the initial um, fundraising in, in 2004. I think um, so from my point of view you know I 
it's very important for me to get that balance right over the long term. I think um, you know the changes we're making to achieve that balance to be correct is creating a strong, profitable business as well as one that has exemplary social and environmental impact. So if you look at our financial performance over the last five years, you'll have seen it going from significant loss making to consistent profitability. And that's, that's, that's moving up over time. I think the other thing that, that's fundamental is for us to scale the business up dramatically. Mm. So, you know, to, to take the growth from five to 10% to 15 to 20% per annum to higher. And, um, we do that whilst maintaining our operating um, model, we then start to create greater profitability and cash flow. Um, so I'm, I'm very conscious about it because you know, the business is very much about social, financial, and environmental return. And I think you know, it's not about a donation to a charity, it's about a sustainable business model that gets those three sources of capital in balance over time. Um, you know, the, the net asset value of the business in our 2019 reports is about 32 and a half pence, just over 30 pence a share, but yet the shares are trading for less than that on FX. Um, and the net asset value is really about- There's an know, opportunity there. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I mean, the net asset value is really about green coffee beans. So at the moment, you know, a B Corp social enterprise, fast growing, tea, coffee and cocoa brand is valued at less than the, the raw materials that sit in its warehouse. Mm -hmm. um, clearly, uh, there's no financial advice intended, but I mean, right. I, I think, you know, an important part of my job is making sure that there is, is a, a strong financial return as well as a social and environmental return. And, we're, you know, that's, that's um, foremost in my, in my thoughts. I mean, because of the accumulated losses over time, you know, uh, Capital events are probably the best way to create returns. Although, you know, as we, as we grow and perform more strongly, we'll reduce those accumulated losses. Mm. Is, that, is that a relatively um, transparent answer? I think it is, yeah. Thank you. Um, and, you know, I think we have to recognise that often uh, businesses that have such a strong impact have a much longer journey to sustainability potentially, um, you know, but that's not to say that it's, it's not achievable. It's just a longer time frame. Um, so, okay. Um, so we've got about um, seven minutes left, but we still have some questions. So what I'm going to do is just do a few quick fire questions. So if you could um, give me, you know, some short punchy answers, that would be uh, appreciated. So um, there was the question around uh, district councils uh, investing in, in renewable energy and whether that is um, possible or not. And um, I would say from FX's point of view, uh, we've worked with a, a number of councils actually on renewable energy projects and uh, it's quite successful to be able to raise finance for those projects through FX or one of the organizations that we work with so I'd say that yes that's definitely possible and um, you know do contact us but do you have councils as well Matthew investing in your projects? It's quite a timely question we're currently pulling together product which will we see the issue with you know, the, the, the opportunity and the issue of achieving net zero um, at the, the, the council level and, and addressing the climate change emergencies that so many councils or local authorities have announced. And what we think is because we are, we've got the expertise to get stuff built and deliver power to, to um, hosts effectively, that the local authority could be the host, and we're keen to have that positive, that wider positive impact we think that provide, providing a low cost power or by providing um, co-ownership of some renewable energy assets with the local authorities, a really, really positive way to deliver that community benefit to every home, not yep. just those who have the, the luxury of being able to invest. So yes, it's very much a, something that's in the front of our minds at the moment. Yeah, thank you. Uh, and to you, John, is climate change affecting Cafe Direct producers? Um, well, the quick fire answer is yes. Um, 
a, a bit of addition to that would be, um, you know, the, the impact is not only about the yield of the product, but also, you know, about the environments which people are existing. I think we, we try to do quite a lot of work in terms of resilience and part of that is about working closely with farms in terms of managing the environment. Also diversifying farms. So rather than being dependent upon a monocrop, trying to build other aspects of, of strength in terms of, uh, you know, for example, a coffee farm, having a fish farm, a vegetable garden and other sources of income so that you're managing a changing environment. I mean, for coffee and, and tea in particular, some of the places that you, you've got coffee and tea from will find it very difficult in the future on the current trajectory. Um, Matthew, question for you. Um, onshore versus offshore wind. Uh, what's happening? It's, um, yeah, it's tricky um, to, for for us. We've we've so we've very much focused on onshore renewables generally um, because of the the kind of size or our scale. Um, so to play a meaningful part in a um, offshore wind farm takes um, knocking on the door of billions now, not even millions. So for us, having that. Um, yeah, we, we've typically worked with, with the onshore projects. Um, offshore has made so much progress in terms of cost um, reductions, and the UK's offshore sector really is leading the way. Um, so we are looking at ways that we can interact with that. And we think an interesting development on that is the way that the Scottish, um, the equivalent of the Crown Estates for, for Scotland, uh, dividing up their seabed um, in for, for, for offshore projects, which will probably mean that they're smaller projects. So it's something we're we're actively monitoring and um, seek ways of of, uh, of again providing that conduit for individuals to play a role in that as well. But there's still lots to be done onshore, um, and so yeah, we, we're comfortable with that, but keen to to find a way to channel individuals into the um, offshore space if, if there is an opportunity there. Lovely, thank you. And and just to sort of wrap up, if if you both like to give us your uh, short one minute um hopes for the future john you first i think i think you know business with purpose and business that's more about making you know a good balance between finance uh improving society and improving the environment needs to become the norm and i think the momentum in that is is becoming quite astonishing i think when i joined eight years ago it was you know relatively uh, you know, unknown i think now you know the number of people who are wanting to join businesses that have a higher purpose uh, whether it's investors or suppliers or employees it is quite outstanding and I, you know i'm very hopeful that uh, as we move through the, the 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 crisis we're all in at the moment that more and more people will put their values um up front and and support businesses that make a fundamental difference to the way we run our lives Wonderful. Matt, hard to follow that. Yeah, I'd, I'd echo <laughs> that. Um, but ad additionally, I think that what's particularly, whilst, whilst we certainly wouldn't have wished the circumstances of COVID to have been the catalyst for change, but I think that what we've seen from a, a UK, well, pretty much a global energy system perspective, is that renewables have had a growing presence. Um, and with the reduction in demand for electricity that, that the globe is seeing at the moment, um, with the, the, the various different lockdown measures, um, grids and the systems are learning really quickly to use to, to, to manage systems with the majority of the power coming from renewables. And I really think that's provided a live lab, which has taken us sort of 10, 15 years into the future and coming back as, as, the, the, as, the, as we recover from the current crisis. Will, the, the, the system will know it can realistically work with majority renewables. And that's a really, really crucial bit of learning and gives us a lot of hope for a properly sustainable system going forward. Excellent. Um, so thanks very much to both of my uh, guests today, to John and to Matthew. Um, that's really nice discussion and, and two quite different businesses, but with, you know, obviously a, a common purpose and I think that's um, wonderful to have you. So thanks very much. Uh, we'll send some follow-up to everybody in terms of any outstanding questions or, or 
resources if required. Um, and look forward to the next Kappa Club. Thanks very much both. Bye. Thanks.